So our next definition is what it means for one set to be a subset of another. And the, w the way we define this is A is a subset of B if and only if every element of A is also in B. Or the way I think about this kind of in my head, think of it as being contained. A is a subset of B if A is contained in B. And I also have a more formal definition of here. A is a subset of B if and only if for every X, X is an element of A implies X is an element of B. And we have a notation for this, where we use this uh, kind of sideways U with a line under it. We'll talk about why that line is significant in just a minute. So I've got some examples here, and I want to think about which of these sets are subsets of the other. And I, I may not hit on every combination, but I, I want to hit on some of these that uh, illustrate particularly important points. So first, just applying the basic definition, B is a subset of A. Because every element of B is also on the A list, right? B is contained in A. Now, I would also say that C is contained in A. That's also a fair ball. Right? And yes, there actually is a complete match. Zero, one, two and three. So we can actually go a step further and say A and C are equal to each other, right, as well as being subsets. And let's see, now we, we've got D here. D is not a subset of A. And the reason there is D has a number that is not up here in A. So the way we would write that, D is not a subset of A. We write that the way we always write not, right? We, we take the subset symbol and put a line through it. And finally, down here, uh, I have a, a kind of a new set. This is a set with nothing in it. That is a special set, right? The set with nothing in it is called the empty set. Sometimes it's written like this, it's just literally an empty set, so you know, the set notation with nothing in it. Uh, and there is another symbol we use, it says, it looks like an O or a zero with a line through it. So, is this set a subset of A? Well, that's a tricky question, right? Because, I mean, we, we have to ask, is every element of E in A? But E has no elements. So is this true or is it not true? Well, if you, if you think back to our earlier discussion of logic uh, and vacuous truths, remember the example I used was uh, we had a, a logical statement, every student in the room is enrolled in the class, and we, we looked at the situation where there were no students in the room. In that case, could we, could we say the statement is true or should we say it's false? That's literally the situation we have here. The empty set has no elements in it, it's like there being nobody in the room. So our conclusion is going to be the same. When we talked about the classroom example, we concluded that the statement was true, even when there was nobody in the room. And this statement is also going to be true, even when there is nothing in the set. So yes, I would say that E is a subset of A. So we have a next definition here, and this is this is almost the same as a subset. Almost the same. We're just going to add one extra piece. Starts off the same way. A is a subset of B. Excuse me, A is a proper subset of B. If and only if every element of A is also in B and, and this is the new part, A is not equal to B. So in practical terms, what that's saying is, Every element of A is, is in B, and B has at least one extra element that isn't in A. And that's over here in, in the definition, my, my formal definition. It starts off the same way. For every X, X, is, X, if X is in A, then X is in B. And here we have that extra part. There exists an element in B that is also, that's the and, right? And that element is not in A. So look down here at my examples again. Uh, only one of these is going to change. 
Only one of them, and that's going to be that special one we talked about. Where I pointed out earlier, I said, yeah, C and A are the same, and I don't care. C is still a subset of A. Now, C is not, however, a proper subset of A. All the other conclusions still apply. B is both a subset and a proper subset. D is still not. If it's not a subset, it's not going to be a proper subset. And E is also still a proper subset because there are certainly elements of A that are not in E. In fact, all the elements of A are not in E. So now, I, I want to revisit the idea of equality. Right, up at the top here, this, this was our, our formal logical definition of what it means for two sets to be equal. A is equal to B if and only if for every X, X is in A if and only if X is in B. Now I want you to remember and think back where right? we, we talked about uh, a biconditional, this if and only if, being equivalent to P implies Q and Q implies P. Well, that's how I've written it on the next line. Right on the first part, I have X an element of A implies X an element of B. And then over here in the second part, I reversed them. X an element of B implies X an element of A. But if you look back, right, if you look back, this is our definition of A is a subset of B. And this part here would be B is a subset of A. Okay, so this is, I, I want you to kind of hold on to this, right? This I, A is equal to B is equivalent to A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. I want you to file that one away, right? Hold on to it. We're going to circle back to it uh, in the next chapter when we start talking about proving things about sets. This here is going to be the method that we use to show the two sets are equal. First, we're going to show that one of the sets is a subset of the other, and then we're going to show the reverse, right? And that's going to imply that the two sets are equal. So hopefully you're, you're continuing to get an appreciation for why we went to all the trouble of talking about all those logical forms and logical equivalences back in the first two chapters. Being able to, to find these logical equivalences between formal versions of a definition uh, are going to allow us to come up with the methods that we're going to use to actually apply those definitions and prove things. So it may have seemed like a very theoretical exercise at the time. But there really are useful things that we can infer from those logical principles. So looking ahead into the next uh, into the next lecture, we're going to talk about logical operations, things like union, intersection, and complement.